but he most often works behind the scenes in an invisible realm. He does so in our world so much so that believers often see his handwork and rejoice. But unbelievers see nothing. Most do not know or believe in anything supernatural. Nonetheless, he shows up in many dramatic, special, supernatural and spectacular ways and reveals himself. On this episode of My God Experience, we're sharing the story of a gospel artist, Gloria Brahima. Everything, life, breath, love, my heartbeat, my waking up, my going to sleep, my family, everything is expressed in in everything I see, in everything I know, in everything I'm yet to know, and all that I'm becoming. Everything, most especially his shama, his presence, you know, that cloak, that covering that you know is bigger than you, that is more magnificent than your human body can comprehend, that your spirit connects with in a way like never before. How can you describe him? How do you contain him? How do you, how do you say, what does God mean to me? You know, it's, it's, it's bigger, it's deeper, it's um, wider, it's everything, more than words can, can say, more than music can express, more than my words can find ways to express it all. Yeah. You're born and you come into your own, you have your memories, uh, your family or your mom or dad teaches you how to pray and tells you this is who God is. That's one way. And then life happens and you become your own person. You're growing into something that you envision you would grow into or you would become. And then you begin to form your own opinions for yourself. You begin to search deeper. You begin to ask questions and then you realize some things just don't satisfy. That for me has really been my experience, you know. The, um, the quest to, to find or to know something that is bigger than me that friends cannot give or family cannot give or you know dwelling your skills gifts and talents and potentials cannot you know quench that burning desire and then you're reading books and then you're asking questions and you're lying awake at night and then your your, your, your spirit is searching for something and um, until you find it until you find it knowing that you have met with someone who has defined or is defining your life and purpose, you will never really, really, really be satisfied. So for me, finding God has been a lifetime quest. I don't think you can say you found him. You know, he keeps, you keep, you keep coming, you keep, and he keeps showing you his vastness. He keeps showing you his depth. He keeps showing you his beauty. You think you've seen him in one way, and then he reveals himself in another way. Sometimes he's fire, and sometimes he's like, whew, like a breeze and sometimes he's big and loud and bright and then sometimes he's and you're wondering groping where are you right now mm. I think if if you come to realize that he is present in everything and in every way I think it makes life a little bit more um, what I say you you'd understand life a little bit more you understand the circumstances and the situations that life has thrown at you and you definitely will see him revealed mm. in your entire life and existence Communion with this being, this person you have a relationship with, is essentially what it is, a relationship. Sometimes I'm loud and ecstatic. I'll tell you one crazy thing I did. I told a friend of mine this a few days ago, and the person could not believe I did it. I was on a plane. I couldn't sleep. I never sleep on flights. And um, I was awake, and the entire plane was asleep. You know what I did? just removed my seatbelt, got on my knees. I had my hands up raised like this. I was caught up in that moment, you know. I, was, I just felt like, yes, I'm high up in the clouds, but there was something going on. I actually felt as if I was transcending and there's just something beautiful knowing that God was with me. And I just felt like communicating or expressing that at the same time. And it suddenly dawned on me, oh my goodness, if anybody gets up now, you know, and sees me, hands lifted, you know, just on the floor there, <laughs> <laughs> what are they going to do? What are they going to think that I want to blow up this plane and it will cause a frenzy? So I, I just came to myself and I got jumped on my seat. I went to the bathroom and I was there and I was like this. That was a moment. 
you know, I've had moments too when I've been, you know, mad at God, you know, being realistic. This is how I feel. I've hit pillows, I've punched a wall, and I've expressed my anger or my disgust at some things in life. That was me praying. I've had moments too when I've, you know, just been silent in his presence, you know, just quiet, just basking in the awesomeness of who he is because the, the minuteness, if there's a word like that, of who I am is reverent and understanding that he's here, bigger than me, bigger than anything I'm dealing with. And so I think my prayer life is more of these kind of expressions of understanding that he's real to me, he understands me, understands my language and my makeup, understands how I express myself, and I'm confident enough to relate with God that way. I come to him knowing that he's my father, and my father loves me. My father knows all that he knows about me. He is not, um, he's not surprised that I am this way, and he is not shocked that I'm going to be any other way. So prayer is really that simple. It's not that complicated. It's just us realizing um, that we have this relationship we can take advantage of. If there's anything I know, or anything we should know, is that he's not tired of us coming before him. We were born, we were made, we were created, we were inspired to be ever before him. That's why we're here, every other thing is secondary. Seek you first, the kingdom of God, and all the things we added on to you. Um, and he came that he might give us life and life more abundantly. So everything about him, everything about why we are here shows that he has our best interest at heart, primarily before we begin to talk about destiny or purpose, you know, and, and all the other things that come with that. Now, our humanity, the humanity that you and I have in the flesh experience, and because we cannot necessarily see this invisible God, limits us. It is and will always be the limitation. You know, I'm speaking with you. I know you're here. I can see you. I can hear you. It's a different thing if you're not in the room and I'm speaking to you vicariously on the phone or something. It's a different thing when your spirit is taught and you're in tune to be in touch with this person and have a relationship with this person that you're daily growing into or walk with in terms of maturity, hearing the word of God, growing in the things of the spirit. There are many times in my life that I actually felt abandoned, rejected, disillusioned, depressed, suicidal, empty, devoid of anything to offer myself, talk less of offering the next person or the rest of the world. I can't even believe I'm in an interview session with you right now, talking about then versus now. And it, it's humbling, and I'm not ashamed to say I've come a mighty long way. I am not ashamed of my testimony in Christ. More so, grace has done this, grace has enabled this, and grace has made it so. There's so many incidences or so many times when I've, 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 I felt that way, and um, when I wondered, where are you? This seems like Golgotha. It seems like Calvary, and you're hung up high for the whole world to see, and you're dealing with this great, Thing and you don't see a way out. I'll choose one. <laughs> I'll choose one. Mm. I think I know the one, I'll, I'll tell you. I was rejected as a Christian as a teenager uh, by my family. They didn't know any better at the time. I think they thought they were doing me a whole lot of good. They loved me, no doubt. They still do. But I think uh, my parents at the time, you know, were limited in what they understood as to how to guide me accordingly. Did I doubt that they loved me? No. I know they did. They still, well, my dad does. My mom is late now. But um, one of those times, and it took me a long, long time. It took us a long time, actually. We're talking about um, highs and lows in the, 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 in the dynamics of our relationship. One of those nights, I was asked to leave the house. Um, over a mini conversation, it had, there was no provocation, nothing. I was just asked, you know what? I think it's, you think you can spend the night outside? 
<laughs> I make it sound so casual and all, but it really did happen. And so I went out of the house and I slept on the streets. And um, it's cut a long story short, I can't speak about that entire night. But the following night again, the same thing happened. Yes, I did feel abandoned. I cried most of the time. I didn't believe that God loved me because I figured if I'm standing for you, if I'm believing that you're with me, why would you allow these kind of horrible things happen to me? Why would I pray up and pray up all the time and just, oh, I hope my dad and mom are okay with me today. I hope when I go home for Christmas, everything will be fine. I hope I will never get called into all those meetings where they'll ask me the different questions about the faith and all that. Those are the kind of prayers I prayed, but it didn't stop persecution, it didn't stop the trials or the, or, the, or the things I had to deal with from happening. I didn't understand and no one taught me at the time that persecutions and trials and all that would happen, but they happen and they are, they happen and they still happen. Mm. And so um, I spent the night on the street because I actually did think that, you know, by midnight, you know, they'd open the gate and call me back in, you know, and Time is going, it's 11, it's 12, and it's 1 a.m., and it's 2, and then you're still, you know, oh, Paul and Silas, they prayed, you know, and, you know, uh, the Holy Ghost came down, and you're feeling like, yes, I'm going through persecution for Christ, and you're thinking you're strong, and you can handle it, and then it's 3 a.m., and then some police people are passing on the street and wondering, what's this girl doing out here? you know, Hamatan night like this. And then you two, you're also looking boldly at them and you can't sleep because the truth is, you're, you're, you're standing watch as well for yourself. And then it's 4 a.m. and then it's 5 a.m. and then it's 6 a.m. and another day rolls by. And then you rush into the house and you maybe grab your wallet and your toothbrush and rush out again because remember, you were asked to leave. And I walk down the street and bought myself a Capri Sun and some suya just to put something in my tummy and came back to my duty post in front of my house and this time around it was different I sat there on the pavement on the concrete on the road and um, the reality of what I was dealing with dawned upon me it's real you're in trouble with your family you have nowhere to go. But prior to that, I had gone to a family friend's house and I said, look, see what's happening to me. And she said, what? And I called some of my cousins and I said, go back and beg your parents. And I had done that, but it hadn't made a difference because what do you tell people who formed an opinion and who say, we will break this thing off here. And when you have two wonderful parents who agree on something, and when my parents then back then agree on something, ain't nothing, ain't nothing shaking that, you know. And they had decided that they were going to, you know, be real and deal with this thing this time around. And so I sat out there in the street and mosquitoes were biting. So I had to take the polythene bag and tie around my legs to avoid. And I was cold too, Hamatan night, and to give me some warmth and maybe to, you know, give me some kind of... And then I took the newspaper that I've been used to wrap the suya and I put it down on the pavement. Maybe in my mind I thought it was a little duvet or bed sheet. And um, I tried to sleep. It was difficult, it was a cold floor. It was a dark Hamatan night. How do you sleep on the streets when you don't know where you're going, when you don't know what's happening, when you don't know what's coming. And I tried, and I tried, and I'd wake up and I'd, you know, I'd sit up again, and then I'd see shadows coming, and I wasn't sure who was walking through the misty night. And I'd sit up again, and then I was cold, and I was... <sighs> I remember that incident nearly every day when I worship, because I'm about to tell you something as to why it's poignant for me. All of a sudden, I heard a sound. I heard a sound from underneath the gate. It was a scraping sound. Like that scraping house. I was too spent to even analyze what was going on. But I heard that sound. And then I realized that a dog, a dog in our compound, in my house, had made a hole 
from underneath the gate on the opposite side and burrowed his way out, came out to the opposite side of the street. The gate was locked, but he made a hole and came out. The interesting thing I'm about to tell you about that dog is that he had no tail, he had no back. He was nameless and a dog we'd never wanted to associate with because well, my family kept a lot of pets at the time. But to show you how, in quote, useless he was, I don't even remember his name, if he even had a name. Had a name. We, don't, we didn't like him. We thought, well, what's this useless little dog doing in the house? That night, this dog, tailless, barkless, useless, came to me in the street there. He looked at me and he came by my side and then he would bark, you know, and he, 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 he had this aura, he had this thing that showed him, showed me that he was fighting for me. And then he would go to a corner and just bark, and then come back to me and sit. And then he'd go to the left again and bark as if he was defending me from things I couldn't see. And I was in awe of what was happening. I couldn't help but just open my mouth and think, what is going on here? And he did that the entire night. He'd come back and sit by my side and just wait. Then he'd get up again and run to the side like he saw something and, like, and assert himself and then come back again. And we did this the entire night. 5 a.m., 5.30, before dawn, this dog came to me and started rubbing his fore all over me, all over my body, all over back and forth, like he was comforting me. And then I heard a word clearly say, my spirit, I just heard the word, for you know, Gloria, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And then the dog went back in to the same hole he made. If I ever doubted that God was with me my entire life, that day proved that God was with me. He used a dog that could not bark. He used a dog that had no tail. He used a dog that had no name. If I asked my siblings today, who, who was that? What was that dog? They would, I don't think anybody would remember. But whenever I worship, whenever I think about how far I've come, and I've come a mighty long way, that particular incident, when I was alone, when I was cold, when I had, when I was abandoned, when I felt, you know what, I don't even know where my life is going from here. God showed up mm. and he used a dog. Mm. And I never heard that dog back again after that night. I can only say that after the fact now. Um, I'm a lot more mature. Um, I had people encourage me along the way. A few people, very few, but very strategic people. I, I, I bless God for them. I bless God, I call them my human angeloids. <laughs> a few people who kept saying, it's gonna change, it's gonna turn around. You'll see, one day they'll celebrate you. You'll see. For the, for, the, for the joy that was set before Jesus, he endured the cross. And I held on to that scripture like my life depended on it. For what I'm going through right now, for this trial, this issue, this fire, you know, there's joy ahead, there's something ahead. I held on to this scripture like my life depended on it, like it was the very breath that I, that I breathed at that time. My late mom, my mom died in a plane crash, the Bellevue plane crash in 20, 2005, eight months before she passed away, she, um, she reached out to me and um, apologized, said she was sorry for the years we had lost, for the time she had spent, you know, 
pushing me away from her. And in eight months, we, 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 there was some kind of dramatic restoration in our relationship. She had confided in me about several things. And I didn't know the Lord was calling her home that same year. So in some way, I had some kind of closure with her. Yes, I never saw her body, you know, after the crash. She was, no one, no one, you know, uh, no one came out of that crash. But in some way, the Lord allowed in his merciful kindness um, some kind of closure with her. With my dad, it was another beginning. And we went through years still of trying to find some kind of uh, meeting point in our relationship. Yesterday was, my dad was in Lagos the entire week. I spent the entire week with him. I played soccer with him, my nephews. I drove him everywhere he needed to go. I have a huge smile on my face because um, one of the times he went somewhere, he went into a pharmacy to get something and he saw me on a magazine and he told him, that's my daughter. And he bought the magazine and um, It used to be, um, are you Sarah Brimer's daughter? Now it's, are you Gloria's daddy? Everywhere he goes, um, he walks into an establishment or an office, or he's traveling, and are you, oh, wow, are you, are you Gloria's daddy? He says yes. I don't know what kind of restoration this is, but it's Psalm 126 all the, way, all the way. When the Lord turned again the captivity of Gloria, she was like then that dream dreams. Because we're talking about years of sustained pain, years of systematic breakdowns, years of... <laughs> Before these trials started, God sent someone to me, someone I'd never met, someone who didn't even know my name. And she told me, you will go through great things for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And she gave me specifics, prophetic word. Three months after these things started. Sometimes when you're going somewhere and gone, and even the enemy has a, a sniff about it, he does everything, he raises up his armies, he, he, he comes with everything to fight you, to stop you, to hinder you, to halt you from where you're going. That's how my life has been. I'd say that as long as you wake up every morning, as long as your heart is still beating, know that God is not done with you yet. If you didn't wake up, there'd be nothing to live for, nothing to hope for. There'd be nowhere to go. If you didn't wake up, you wouldn't even see a little bit of sunlight to even say, oh, I'm here, I can appreciate it, and I can even dream a little. If you didn't, that's a different thing. But as long as you wake up, you've got to know and you've got to fight for your life because no one else will do it for you. Your friends call, and when they hang up, what happens? Um, you go to a gathering and everyone is happy and honky-dory. And when you're done and you leave there, what happens? You take a selfie, you're looking nice that day, and everyone tells you, ooh, you're cool, you look beautiful. And when you wipe off the makeup, <laughs> or when the makeup is wiped for you, um, what happens? You will always have those moments when you're left by yourself. And in those moments, you have to remember that you have a God who is with you, ever present, who is fighting for you, who has your best interests at heart. And in those moments of silence, in those moments of contemplation, in those moments of, of your aloneness, those are where, that's, that's when those thoughts creep in. That's when that cloud comes. You've got to fight. No one else will fight for you. But is he there? Yes. 
Is he willing to help you? Yes. Can you take steps towards, you know, um, coming out of this thing, of this phase? Yes, you can. You will see reminders every day. There will be a song to play. There will be a song that your spirit connects with. There will be a placard you just find. There will be something on a trailer. One of those funny signs that just reminds you. There will always be something. And there's an undeniable, unshakable word of God that will keep you and guide you. So yes, you will be delivered. Yes, you'll be set free. And know that the love of God is able to keep you and preserve you in all ways. God reveals himself in many forms. He speaks to us through a burning bush, later out of a whirlwind, and to Elijah in a gentle whisper. When God shows up, something significant will happen, something we need to pay attention to. We bless God for the life of our sister, Gloria.